Butler Shaver with his Gandalf stick. Yay. If you're a goblin, run. The great Steph Kinsella. Yay. And Jeff Brewer. Is he up? Jeffy Jeff? Jeffy B? No, Charles Johnson. Charles? Yeah. Jeff? Charles. 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 Charles Johnson? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay, so if you guys want to have a seat, uh, our general uh, format is, as you imagine, rules free. So just, you know, opening statements and uh, take your turns as you see fit. Are you guys going to take I think questions? we need a third chair. Yeah. Did you want to, I thought we were just going to use a podium. Oh, I see. We can bring out three chairs if you like. I think three chairs is, that's what we did yesterday. I think that works out well. And uh, remember, the first three rows must tackle. That is the rule. You must tackle. And in fact, under your seat, a uh, bucket of fruit. Fairly old. And skin it. Yeah, you can skip on it. Oh, okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. No problem. That just comes with the territory. All right, Mr. Butler, if you'd like to take it away, I will uh, receive you in the background. Are we all set? We're set. So this all turned on, I assume. All right. <coughs> and we'll turn it on. Our panel has to do with the question of significance of intellectual property in the Bill of Rights. Question of significance of intellectual property. Can we not hear? Turn up your faces out there. Okay. Um, I'm doing moderating, I guess, and leave it up to these two fine people to do all the substantive stuff. I would like to at least start this off with one question, which maybe we can get some response and get this fun thing started. <laughs> and that has to do with whether or not in a stateless society would we have patents or copyrights. And be careful how you answer that question. I don't, if it's either a yes or no answer, it's going to lead to a sub-question. What do you think? Charles, do you want to start since I had a, a shot at this yesterday? Uh, sure. So my, my position is no. There's not going to be copyright or patent protections that look anything like the, uh, the bundle of legal protections that go along with those today. Yeah, of course I agree. Uh, I actually think there wouldn't be trademark, trade secret, or any other type of IP yeah. as well. That, you know, we're all... <laughs> <laughs> the reason I ask that, the reason I ask it in the form of a question for which yes or no might not be a complete answer is, um, do, do either of you see a problem with copyright or patent arising out of contract between two parties? Um, well, so, so the first thing I'd want to do here is, is um, draw, draw a line for a moment between copyrights and patent, patents when it comes to uh, comes to potential like trying to kludge around it through through a contractual mechanism. Um, so in, in the case of patents, of course, you have um, discoveries are held to be patentable, uh, uh, and the monopoly enforceable against other discoverers, even if there's no prior relationship, whatever. Um, you know, there's so if if you have independent discoveries, the patent is still held to to give a, a monopoly privilege to uh, the initial discoverer. And it seems that there's, it's, it's, it's not only that people would be unlikely to come up with contracts to try and recreate this sort of thing, but there's no possible contract you could come up with um, because it's perfectly possible for people to produce the innovation without having contact. Um, now, I think it's true that if you buy a manuscript from someone, say, you're perfectly, in, you're perfectly entitled to sign a contract with them that restricts your right to copy what you bought. Um, you know, sort of property can be entailed under contractual obligations, but a 
again, that's not that's so that's not going to look much of it in practice. That's not going to look much of anything like the bundle of uh, privileges that goes along with existing copyrights. Uh, it's the contracts that you sign are binding on you and not on uh, not on third parties. Um, and uh, so, you know, um, there's there's not going to be sort of a, a an independent right to like the idea that you can assert against anyone who happens to get their hands on it or who happens to be distributing it unless you can point to the specific contract that they signed with the original uh, the original seller. Uh, I agree completely with that. Um, some might say you could have a, a click wrap agreement, you know, and, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm even skeptical of the validity of those types of agreements because they often contain fine print that people don't read um, and the the seller knows that not being read, so I would even be hesitant to say that that's evidence of the terms of the actual contract. Um, further, I think that it's unlikely anyone would sign such a contract. Mm -hmm. uh, to buy a $12 book, you're potentially obligating yourself to pay millions of dollars of damages if you use the information you learn from the book in, in the wrong way. And it's just not worth the risk to most people. So almost no one would sign these books. You would go on to the next publisher that had more reasonable terms. And if the terms are a very small amount of penalty, then it's not going to have any kind of disincentive effect anyway on people breaching the contract. They'll just make a copy and pay their $20 fine, and, and they don't care. Now, that said, I would say that I think that uh, in a free market, there would be more scope for cartel-like arrangements to arise that could have some kind of um, uh, dampening effect on types of piracy. For example, in the fashion industry, there used to be um, like a guild or a cartel system where they would police themselves and anyone who was knocking off new designs was ostracized and shunned. But then if I recall, the, uh, this was shut down by the federal government under violation of antitrust law. So, um, so of course, that law wouldn't exist in a free society. So companies would have more flexibility to try to enter into arrangements to try to deal with this sort of free rider problem uh, and knockoff problem. I think that the old common law there was, or maybe even today, maybe it's not just the old common law, the common law system, there was something called a common law copyright. And what this meant was that if I write what I consider the great American novel or a great American uh, piece of poetry or whatever, and put it in my desk drawer, and you come along and discover that and run off with it and publish it, at the common law, I would have had a cause of action against you for violation of a <coughs> common law copyright. But that common law copyright ended at the point at which I took what I had written and published it. And the common law published did not mean print. I, mean, I think we kind of confuse that today. Mm -hmm. the, the public something means you send it to someone who sets it up in typeface and prints copies of it and distributes it. But to publish something is always meant to make it public. And once I had done that, I had lost my ownership rights at the common law, uh, primarily uh, because of the, the failure to satisfy one of the essential elements of, of property ownership, and that is control. How can I own something if I no longer control it? If I have put that out into the market, out into the world, so to speak, in what way can it be said that I'm still the owner of it? Use this sort of an analogy, the idea of somebody being able to uh, put oxygen into a canister. And as long as the oxygen is in the canister, you can say they own it, they own the oxygen. Uh, somebody else who comes along and wants to um, take a whiff of that oxygen, I can sell it to it, 50 cents a whiff or, or whatever. But suppose the valve leaks on my canister of oxygen, and some of my oxygen gets out into the atmosphere, and you run up and you notice that, and you take a strong breath and you breathe in some of my oxygen. Do you owe me any money for that? What do you think? The common law copyright, um, <clears throat> which I believe has been superseded by the Copyright Act, uh, yeah, um, is really similar to trade secret law. Under trade secret law, the idea is that if you 
diligently work to keep private information private that gives you a competitive advantage over your customers so long as they don't have the information, then if one of your employees, let's say, leaves and is telling this secret to a competitor or threatening to reveal it to a newspaper, then the employer can run to the courts, get an injunction against <coughs> the leaking employee and the third parties who have learned about it, so long as it's not generally public yet. Um, and actually, this is why I oppose trade secret law as well. I think it's totally unjustified to have court force used against the third party with no contractual relationship uh, with the original secret holder. Um, common law copyright seems a little bit more justifiable. It seems like it's a measure of damages of basically an act of, act of trespass. So I could see it being justified on those grounds. But that's about it, and that won't get you anywhere near to modern copyright or patent type legal systems. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely, um, and I think that um, it, seem, it seems to me that insofar as there's a case for damages in the kind of case envisioned in common law copyright, it is going to be dependent on there being an identifiable um, identifiable sort of violation of, of concrete property. So if you, leave your, um, if you leave your manuscript on the bench, and I find that, it's hard for me to see, um, you know, Given that I haven't broken into your desk, given that this is sort of presumptively abandoned property, it's hard for me to see where the um, uh, where the damage to tangible property occurs that would justify uh, inflicting damages on the finder and the publisher. Yep. Well, the reason I ask the question is that apart from a common law copyright, it seems to me that the only copyright and patent. Uh, protection that people have in modern society is something that arises out of the state. In other words, the state creates it. And I think this raises some very serious questions about whether or not the state is in a position to really create anything. Uh, it's a little bit like the, the question, which I think is a related question, of uh, whether or not the state and uh, corporations, for example, which are also creatures of the state, can be looked upon as persons. Um, you know, I'd like to, I saw a bumper sticker some time back, I really like it, said, I would, I would believe that the corporation is a person when they execute one of the electric chair. Um, it's it's hard to imagine that something that has an artificial creation that is not created in the same genetic fashion that we think of as other persons, it's, a, it's an artificial person. The idea that these bodies can have the kinds of interests that we attribute to a sense of personhood, I, I find it very troublesome. Particularly if, if we are going to consider the possibility of, of, of altering or abolishing the political system or uh, doing away with the corporation. Can we do that? If these are, if these are persons, do we ever uh, decide to do away with the corporation? Uh, any more than if, if we can't do this with our children, you know, we can't <laughs> I think we've probably accepted the idea that just because we've created children doesn't mean we can destroy them after we destroy these other organizations. And these are the organizations, the state, that uh, creates these patent and copyright interests. And then I find that trouble. What are thoughts on that? Um, yeah, well, so I, I think that the state origin of copyright privileges, <coughs> patent privileges, and other other things classed under intellectual property is, is very important to track, and that these ought to be considered by libertarian economists to, to be treated um, as part of the same analysis of other forms of coercive monopoly um, and other forms of, of protectionism on behalf of incumbent interests that um, uh, sort of the exercise of state privilege in order to create these artificially rigged markets is um, something that's not sort of a not uh, um, not an instantiation of property rights, but but rather the um, uh, uh, sort of the profound violation of them. It's something that that 
really needs to be to be treated in the same kind of breath as we treat uh, you know, government monopolies on energy, government monopolies on roads, and other other uh, sort of uh, vital services. Um, I would actually agree uh, that. Um of course, the state and corporation statute should be uh, um, nullified. Uh, legal personhood should be given up as a fiction. Um, and I would even eliminate uh, the state's grant of limited liability for shareholders, but that doesn't mean that an organization that has passive investors, uh, the passive investors would be vicariously liable for the torts of employees of the corporation that they've invested in. Uh, so I don't even know if limited liability is a privilege because I don't know if it's needed to prevent shareholders from being liable in the first place. But I would say that um, the effect of IP, for example, is one effect that gives rise to these huge dominant mon oligopolies and monopolies. I um, mean, just take Microsoft and uh, Apple. Um, you know, Microsoft made billions of dollars in extra monopolistic profits because of the copyright monopoly the state gets it. <coughs> Then it uses these extra profits to pay patent lawyers to file patents, and then they use the patents to squelch competition as well and keep their oligopoly or their monopoly up. Uh, you know, maybe they can be defended from a lawsuit from Apple. Maybe Apple can defend itself from a lawsuit from Samsung and Google maybe and Microsoft. Um, and then they all just settle. They pay each other a few million dollars or a billion dollars. They go on their way. And they have, meanwhile, they're erecting a walled garden of protectionism where smaller companies on the outside can't even compete with them because they're violating one of the patents of the companies in there or the copyright. Um, and if they get sued, they can't defend themselves because they never made the money in the first place to acquire a big arsenal of patents. So IP clearly has a monopolizing, oligopolizing effect and makes the evil of – what evil of corporations have, it, it exacerbates it makes it much worse. I, I think that, that um, I just want, one thing that I want to add to that is, is that um, given, given the, the increasing role that intellectual property restrictions are playing in propping up sort of the, the business models of, um, you know, as, as sort of a number of the key technology companies also, of course, uh, uh, you know, other Fortune 500 companies uh, like Time Warner, uh, Disney, and so on, um, that... It's it's important to it's it's important I think to complexify some of the discussion of, uh, for example, international trade agreements that libertarians have engaged in thus far, because um, these are sold as um, you know so I'm thinking agreements such as NAFTA, CAFTA, CORE, FTA, and so on, which have been sold as routes to market liberalization and uh, liberalizations of international trade. And they do genuinely reduce overall tariff levels, which is a genuine. Uh, benefit to sort of everybody affected by them, but simultaneously these same agreements have included bundled within them uh, massive synchronized increases among the the uh, participants in the multilateral agreements to uh, to the extension of copyright terms, also the implementation of much more draconian enforcement mechanisms. So, like the U.S. government standardly bundles into its multilateral trade agreements that the, the other signers uh, adopt uh, technology control measures uh, like the U.S.'s uh, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which uh, restrict technologies that might possibly be used to crack right. encryption. Right, which we call computers. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so in one sense, these, these agreements offer, offer significant reductions of one kind of protectionism, but simultaneously um, they involve massive synchronized increases in another form of protectionism, and I think precisely because as we've moved into more of an information economy, uh, monopolistic control over uh, tangible <coughs> goods and services has become less central uh, to uh, maintaining monopolistic privileges, and control over information has become more central and more lucrative, and so the shift of um, uh, the, the focus of state power has shifted more and more towards the, uh, the, the new areas that are sort of the most important for them to control. Well, we're all in wonderful agreement up here as to our uh, disaffection with copyrights and uh, patents and so forth. I suppose I thought it play the devil's advocate and offer some of the arguments that defenders of copyrights and patents will provide, and that is that without them, uh, without the protection uh, that's accorded to these discoveries and inventions and so forth, uh, Companies or individuals might not have an incentive 
to incur all of the costs associated with the creation of these new works. And as soon as they were created, a competitor could, who had not incurred these costs would come along, take advantage of those investments that created the item, uh, and, and profit at the expense of those who had created it. How, how do we respond to that? Yeah. Uh, so, <clears throat> I guess there, there's, um, so that, that's a concern that I think is, is a serious concern, so uh, a concern that's worth taking seriously in, in the following sense, that, that I think, so I don't think that it actually worries about like levels of production of intellectual products um, actually can have much reason to cut for or against the fundamental reasons for opposing intellectual property. As I see it, the fundamental reasons for opposing intellectual property are moral reasons having to do with the right to dispose of your own property and the right to control, um, uh, the, right to control the, the contents of your own mind and to speak freely. Uh, and even if it turned out that, you know, even if it turned out that we got no decent level of pharmaceuticals, even if it turned out that art and literature simply collapsed, um, that, you know, that would be, uh, that would be very bad. But, um, you know, I think people have a right to let them collapse if that's what the exercise of their liberty rights leads to. Now, that said, I think that um, the, worry about, the worry about these kind of cases is, um, I, think, I think, best answered in terms of, of trying to think about market mechanisms for, for resolving the problem. So, um, you know, it's true that there are... It's true that there are potential problems with determining, uh, you know, sort of uh, determining good ways to um, uh, ensure that, you know, artists are able to make a decent living uh, off of their labor. Uh, there's problems with figuring out good business models for uh, making profits from pharmaceutical research. Although, you know, of course, there there's a large regulatory structure through the FDA and through a number of other controls that make that a harder problem than it should be. Um, but um, these are problems that I think have to be addressed through entrepreneurial means. And so to take an example of something that um, so it actually is restricted to copyright law, but at the time uh, copyright louder? louder? Yeah. So, so, to, so to take an example um, there's a basic problem about how you can make money from broadcast TV. Uh, given given that you're sending it out into the air for free, anyone who picks it up can watch it without having any contact with you. Um, and, you know, in principle, anyone who picks it up could just as easily record it and pass it along to other people. Um, and the, uh, you know, there's sort of a couple ways that you could try and solve this problem. One is that you could try and solve the public goods problems involved with making money from broadcasting by imposing coercive measures uh, through the state. Uh, you can sort of require that people who buy uh, a television pay a certain tax, which goes to the content producers. It's actually something similar to what they've imposed on the, the, uh, the audio recording market. Um, on the other hand, you could leave it open to uh, competitive processes and to entrepreneurial ex experimentation, because I think this is actually ultimately a public goods problem to be solved like any number of other public goods problems. Right? If, you have a trouble, if you have trouble figuring out how um, if you have trouble figuring out how um, shippers can can pay for uh, lighthouses, the solution is to uh, shift business models and actually to to get consensual payments from the nearby harbor. Similarly, if you have a problem figuring out how broadcasters can make money uh, from their from their watchers, well, one way you can do that is by uh, selling ads to um, um, you know by selling ads to advertising space to advertisers. In which case, the more people watch it for free, the better a position you're in, rather than the worse position. Um, and so, I think uh, in in all of these cases, um, you know, so so an advertising-based model is is in many ways um, reaching the end of its lifetime as a as a usable model for trying to make money uh, because people are getting more control over the sequence they watch things in, and so on. But the, the solution is always going to be to try and engage in an entrepreneurial and competitive discovery process so that you can um, uh, uh, find out the, the, um, 
find out the sort of market pricing mechanism uh, that will make these sustainable enterprises, rather than trying to figure out, rather than trying to to bypass economic calculation by means of a state measure. I, I agree with all that, um, uh, and I, I believe in the uh, UK and uh, parts of Europe, they actually do impose a tax on every television, yeah. and then the government sends these trucks around with the sensing equipment, mm -hmm. like around student yeah. dorms, looking for. TV signals, at least in the CRT days, mm -hmm. and if they catch you having an unlicensed television, you, you know, you're in trouble. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, the state imposes so many costs on companies, mm -hmm. large and small, maybe disproportionately on small, but an absolute cost on everyone. Uh, the FDA process is extremely expensive, uh, time-consuming, taxes alone, uh, pro-union legislation, tariffs, other types of regulations, minimum wage. Um, all impose huge costs on business, and if you get rid of that, instead of trusting the same state that imposed all this on the economy, to add another measure to try to make up a little bit of um, the damage they've done to the, to the companies by giving them the right to charge a monopoly price for a while, just get the state out of the way, everyone would be so much more wealthy. With the extra money, there'd be a lot more money for research and development uh, right off the bat. So th that would be my response to that. As, as far as your original question, the way you posed it is really not fundamentally different than uh, the case any business faces. That is, you come up with an idea that you think can make profit, you engage in the business. If you make a profit, after a while, people will notice and they've learned something from what you've done. They've learned that you have found something that satisfies consumers. And if you have a profit that's obvious and healthy enough, you're going to attract competition. And they're going to come in and compete with you, and gradually your unnatural temporary profit is going to fall, as the free market is designed to do. Uh, well, not designed, but as it does. <laughs> um, and so the fact that in some types of businesses it's somewhat easier for people to compete, or if they can compete quicker because a large part of what you're doing with consumers is selling some easily copyable um, pattern of information then it's just a little bit harder to compete, but you have to figure that out. It's the entrepreneur's job uh, to figure that out, not to go to the government and ask for a legal monopoly to protect him uh, from competition. And, and I, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think that the uh, public goods argument too often um, begs the question, or begs a lot of questions that are sort of presumed to be answerable in terms of generating monetary profits. And I think of so many things that mm -hmm. uh, individuals do that promote some public good or some public interest without any interest, apparently, in wanting to make money out of it. I'm thinking, for example, of the early turnpike movement in this country, when turnpikes were being built by privately owned turnpike companies. And these companies were invested in by private parties and not the state, even though it was understood and the experience played itself out that these companies almost never made money. They were almost always a losing proposition. <clears throat> and apparently there were other objectives or other purposes in mind for creating these turnpikes. I don't know if it would be social in nature or opening up um, markets in a general sense between town A and town, town B. But whatever it was, the people who invested in the turnpike companies, uh, very often, and in fact it might even be said more often than not, lost money on it. They didn't take any money, yet they kept investing in it. And I think about this in relation to uh, language. Uh, I wasn't sure the, the greatest invention uh, that we humans managed to ever create was language. Language is by far a uh, far greater invention than the automobile, the airplane, or, or anything else. And yet, you know, who created this language? <clears throat> or if you want to put it in terms of agricultural products, who created the products that we more or less take for granted as part of some cornucopia, if you will, of, of, of goods that are available to people. Uh, Central American Indians who kind of played around with various grasses and at some point came up with what we now call sweet corn. Uh, 
I'm not aware of any 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 particular group that claimed a patent right of any of this or um, sort of traditional uh, treatments that people came up with using natural herbs and things of this sort that took care of various ailments. I'm not aware that there that Bob or his neighbors or anyone else would have claimed an exclusive right to uh, the use of this particular substance. And yet we presume that the pharmaceutical company, or in the case of food, the food producing company, the Monsanto's of the world, somehow or other can take that particular creation and modify it in some fashion and then claim a property interest in that. And I, I, I am willing to be convinced about anything. I, I'm an agnostic on just about every subject you can imagine, including that one. So if somebody wants to try to convince me how um, Monsanto or any of the other companies somehow or other have a rightful claim to the modification of products which they themselves uh, inherited from some sort of a common stock of mankind. I'd like to hear it. But think of all the great writings. Who, who was probably the most famous writer of all? I mean, if you go back and take a look at um, the books of quotations and so forth. Who, who created at least as much as anybody else? Some, no, no, you're making it easy. <laughs> It was a Greek writer by the name of Anonymous. <laughs> you can go through these, this is by Anonymous, 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 Anonymous. Why isn't there a, some recordation of a copyright? But this particular writer had uh, the exclusive right to the use of that particular quotation or that poem or whatever it is. A lot of us do this. I mean, I, my own writings, I, uh, I copyright them for one reason. I copyright my stuff purely defensively. So that I just put it out there and somebody without copyright and somebody else found it and said, oh, I like that, I think I will copy that, copyright that. And now if Schaefer wants to uh, reproduce that himself, then he might be violating my copyright. So I've done that on my own because of my own writings, but I let the people <laughs> The world know anybody out there will take any of the works that I've done and reproduce them, reprint them, send them out to millions and millions of people without paying me anything. Please, please, please be my guest. Do it. I would love it. Uh, you know, that's something for other reasons than just making money out of it. Let me just go back to what you mentioned earlier the, on the question of, uh, you know, if, if someone, some company sells a, a good that's easily copyable, what's their incentive to do it if they're going to face competition? And I know you're playing devil's advocate, and you're right, that is the devil side, right? Um, but the purpose of law and rights is not to make sure we have the right incentives in place to achieve some predetermined optimum output of some preordained goal, like X, like this many movies or whatever. The purpose of law and rights is justice, protection of property rights, reduction of conflict, permission, you know, permitting people to live in peace and prosperity and harmony with each other. It's got nothing to do with incentives. Um, and I, I would also say that if, if you say what's their incentive for innovating in pharmaceuticals or producing movies, etc., then the IP advocate can argue one of two things. He can argue that there would be no, if we don't have patent and copyright, there's going to be no invention, no innovation, no, no one's ever going to write a novel again, ever. And some of them actually do argue this. Um, um, but that's obviously completely absurd. No one in their right mind can believe that there would be none. At best, they can argue that we have this level of innovation and copyright, I mean, and creative works now, and without copyright and patent, it's going to be lower and it's lower than some ideal, which they apparently know is higher. Um, they have no proof that IP laws even increase this number. In fact, I believe it reduces it, uh, at least distorts it and skews it to different types of works, different types of innovation and invention and research. Um, 
So at most, their argument can be led, used to argue that we need to change the law to increase the amount of innovation. Well, it comes at some cost. How do they know that this, the value of this extra innovation is greater than the cost? And where's the stopping point? Why are copyrights limited to 150 years, roughly, and patents to 17? Why don't we impose the death penalty and make it last a million years? That would certainly you know, incentivize some inventions that are not happening right now that are just beyond the margin uh, of what's feasible now. Um, or we could even go further than that. What if the strongest monopoly protection in the world is just not enough to get people to buy enough of this product to give enough profit motive to give an incentive to people to research and develop? We need more and more works. We always need more innovation, right? Um, so the natural result next, which some um, people have advocated, such as Bernie Sanders, the socialist uh, from Vermont, um, and even Alex Tabarrok, a libertarian, they say, well, let's either replace the patent system or augment it with a taxpayer-funded prize system that a government-appointed panel of experts uh, doles out every year to rewarding recipients. And the, the last proposal I saw was for an $80 billion a year taxpayer-funded prize fund for medical innovations alone. Now, in the patent universe, Medical innovation is one little narrow slice of the pie. You have pharmaceuticals, you have medical devices, well, yeah, that's medical devices. You have chemicals, uh, gene patents, uh, mechanical, electrical software, uh, business methods, tons of other types of patents. So if you're going to apply this logic and scale it up to the entire innovative space of the patent office, you're going to need probably 10 trillion a year or something. I mean, literally, just to do this insane idea of theirs. So we bankrupt the entire country. So the entire idea that we don't have enough innovation is just like saying the price of milk is too high. It's trying to centrally plan the economy and prices and the amount of activity that's engaged in. And we need to stand back and let the free market operate. To, to come back to something that, you're, that, that you said earlier, Butler, about, um, uh, about roads, and in particular the development of, of roads by companies that ultimately weren't necessarily even expected to make any money in the end. Um, I think that that's a very important observation, and it's it's um, it's sort of in, it, it helps to indicate a way in which the current discourse about intellectual property, sort of the, the political debates about it, um, often involve claims from the advocates of uh, intellectual property that are increasingly divorced from any kind of reality on the ground about how people actually produce creative works, um, uh, simply because in uh, uh, Whatever problems there may have been in the past, and I think those were also problems that were perfectly solvable through consensual social means. But, but um, uh, you know, in the age of Kickstarter and in the age of, of you know, uh, millions of, of independent uh, comics artists and writers and, and musicians and any number of people uh, uh, doing their work through the internet um, and being funded through a very, you know, a very impressive sort of array of creative ways of scratching together small amounts of money from lots of people in order to help them make an independent living. Um, that, that sort of the protectionist worries about how are we going to keep, um, you know, how are we going to keep industries sustainable uh, and, and profitable without intellectual property monopolies just seems, um, I guess, sort of increasingly divorced from any kind of actual market reality. That these are problems that, that not only can be solved, but already are being solved. And it's obvious how these things pose a problem to like Warner Brothers' bottom line. But there's no reason, you know, there's no sort of, uh, there's no a priori reason why the, the creative landscape has to involve giant corporations like Warner Brothers uh, or Disney uh, or any of the others. And similarly, when it comes to things like, um, when it comes to like worries about pharmaceutical patents, um, I'm not at all convinced by the standard protectionist arguments that there's no way to have sustainable R&D outside of, uh, or to have sustainable R&D for pharmaceuticals uh, on a for-profit basis without patents. But let's just grant for the moment that that's true. If that's true, then under conditions of freedom, simply the nonprofits will have to do the research and development. And fortunately, we have uh, uh, a long history of nonprofit institutions like universities. Uh, and um, uh, you know, in sort of independent research organizations that already have existing models about how you do fundamental research and try to make 
uh, new innovations available without demanding uh, monetary profit at the end of the day. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Maybe we could mention one other thing. Um, we, we talk a lot about patent and copyright. Those are the two bad ones. Um, but maybe I can just mention um, we should also be concerned about trademark and trade secret, although there's not as big of a deal. Trade secret was used fairly recently by Apple uh, to bust down some guy's door when the iPhone 4S had leaked a year or two ago. Um, uh, trademark law is increasingly bad. It's used for... Um, uh, Suppressing free speech, it's used to suppress competition, it's used to uh, outlaw cheap knockoff goods like you know uh, designer purses and things like this. Um, there is a part of trademark law that you could argue is justifiable. That is, to the extent it's rooted in in some kind of fraud on the consumer. But if that's the case, we we have fraud law already. So I say just completely get rid of trademark and just rely on fraud law. That's all you need, and that would give the cause of action to the defrauded consumer, not to the competitor, and it would also give a cause of action only when there's actual fraud. Uh, unlike in the current case, where you only have to show a likelihood of confusion, which is the trademark standard, which is used, for example, when a consumer buys a fake, a fake a designer purse for $20 or a Rolex watch for $20, he's not defrauded. He actually knows he's buying a knockoff and wants the knockoff. It's cheaper. Uh, so he wouldn't be able to sue in that case. Uh, and as far as trade secret, you know, you don't need the law to keep things secret. All you need is to have your, your, your house and your body protected, uh, standard property law. And uh, you can use contracts with employees, and if they leak, then you can sue them for damages. Um, but the injunction part of trade secret law is totally unjustified. So get rid of trade secret law, rely on contract and property rights, and get rid of trademark and rely on uh, fraud law only. I think the, the assumption that uh, creative people need this kind of protection in order to have an incentive to continue to create is questionable. I, I think that it works with Edison, for example. Uh, I suspect, I obviously didn't know the guy. He was a year or two before me in high school. Uh, but I suspect that there were a lot of work that he did. He did solely for the purpose of finding out how to do his work. I, I remember there were various uh, inventions of his that the photograph was one that afterwards he just said there's no there's no monetary value to this, it would just be a gimmicky toy and that's about the end of it. And I also think that some of the people who are doing some some of the more creative work in the area of uh, drug research, these are people who uh, in the face of the drug war have uh, come up with alternative kinds of drugs. Uh, put together to settle on the, uh, the open market. And I think maybe it's, I, I don't know any people, but I suspect that they probably were as interested in just getting around the problem of the drug war as much as they were anything else. And I think the idea of a, a multi billion dollar um, sum of money to be dispersed by the government, let's say, for personal medical research. Um, who's going to evaluate that? I suspect that the people who are going to evaluate that are those who already have a vested interest in keeping the, the, the goods and the, the machinery and the drugs and so forth as they already are. Sometimes if somebody can go with a sure, sure, fire, perfect uh, drug that would kill cancer in any of its various forms, somehow they have a feeling this would not the person who did that doesn't be the recipient of one of these prizes. I think they might be the recipient of a midnight knock on the door and you know, their works and their labs and notebooks and computers and everything so many times, et cetera. So the idea that this is used to, to encourage fundamentally new research uh, in the face of who it is that's going to be benefited by, who is it going to be threatened by this new research, would make that a minimal uh, consideration in my view. Uh, on, the, on, the drug, on the pharmaceutical issue, um, I, I would also point out that um, um, you could argue that, um, uh, that uh, although a lot of the pharmaceuticals that have been produced are, are wonderful drugs, 
um, that there is a distorting effect of the patent system in pharmaceuticals in that companies uh, use the government to push onto the medical system which the government controls and the prescription system which the government controls uh, more expensive, newer, patented drugs instead of older natural remedies that may work just as well or for a lot uh, lower price. Um, uh, not to say that that's always the case, but I, I do believe that there's an effect of over-medicalizing the nation uh, because there's a financial incentive on the part of the companies that uh, they would rather sell a patented good than one that's not patented because they can sell it for a higher price. This so, sells for $200, it must be good. It must be good, yeah. And then and one other uh, addendum to what I had mentioned earlier, defamation, which is uh, libel and slander law, which is the, basically based upon this idea of a right to your reputation, is not traditionally considered to be a type of intellectual property right, but it's, it, I believe it should be. It's very similar uh, in the arguments for it and in the way it works, and uh, we ought to lump defamation law in with the, say, the big five evil IP laws that need to be uh, completely repealed, and, and defamation law, like copyright, has a tremendously stifling effect on freedom of, of the press and freedom of speech. I think the, I think the weakness in all of this, uh, as government in the program, is that once once you have something out there, defamation is a good example. Uh, you don't have control over your reputation. Once a, 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 a piece of written work or an invention or whatever it is out in the market, you no longer have control over that. It's, it's really impossible to make sense out of the whole concept of private man property uh, in the absence of the ability to, to control, the ability to exclude. And you don't have that with these, uh, these types of government created and government enforced so called property. Defamation is Perfect example of do I do I have a property interest in my reputation? Can I control that? No. Who controls my reputation? You do. Um, I can try all kinds of gimmicks to make you think that you should like me for some particular reason. And some people going through right now are a little But um, whether I prevail or not, it's going to be up to you. Not, there's nothing I can do to get you to alter your opinion. If you think I'm an SOB from the start, uh, at the end I'm still going to be the SOB. So how can I assert that I have a property interest in, in my reputation? I don't see it. Any of the other note of open so there's up to question, that's all a hand go up. And I don't know, do we have a microphone we can get down there to people? Wow. If you can yell loudly, I'll try to repeat it. Uh, 
binding upon some third person. Well, that's they live down here. What? Isn't that how government works all together? Well, and all, yeah, all together and run together. But um, how can we, as a philosophic proposition, how can we justify that? Um, Stephen and I agreed to, to do something. Now all of a sudden, you buy his interest in land. Why should you be bound by the promise that he and I made? Um, let, let me, I, I don't want to take us too far afield here. I have some thoughts on this. I haven't written about it much yet, but I think the restrictive covenant situation is not actually analogous to your hypo. I'll explain why, but the way restrictive covenants can be made to work, I believe, is just to treat all the adjacent plots of land as co-owners of all the land, but each one having a different ownership right. So the resident of one tract is, say, the 99% owner. And everyone else is a 1% owner in the sense that they have a veto right over certain uses of your property. So it's actually not even a contract. It's more of a, a division of property among people. And I think you could find ways that that could run with the land in the sense that you're not able – one of the veto rights is I can't sell my tract of land to a, third, to a new buyer unless he agrees to these terms too. So that way you could prevent, uh, you could prevent someone from getting out of the regime. But in your case, I think I would, I would look at the licensing thing. Well, first of all, the word license means permission. Okay? So in the law, you don't need a license or permission unless someone has the right to stop you, unless there's a property right. So if IP goes away, probably 95% of all the licensing activity will just disappear because people don't need permission. They don't need a license. In your case, you're talking about a contract between a bookseller and a buyer, which we discussed earlier already. Now. There is one possible argument you could make that the third party is somehow a bad guy. Whether he's immoral or not, I don't know. I'll let Charles do that. He's the philosopher. Um, but the argument is in the law there's something called tortious interference with contracts or inducing someone to breach their contract. And if you look at a contractual arrangement between bookseller and book buyer as a type of property right, then this third party is sort of aiding and abetting one guy in breaching someone else's rights. But I think under Rothbard's title transfer theory of contract, a contract is not uh, that kind of property right, and there's no such thing as contract breach. There's only a, a prearranged uh, penalty provision provided for that is triggered by certain specified actions of the buyer. So if the buyer copies the book, he's not in breach of the contract, as he would be said to be under today's law, which I think is conceptually confused. Under a Rothbardian system, he simply is doing something that triggers a payment of money, and the hope on the part of the seller is the prospect of that will incentivize him not to do it because he's going to incur a cost. But if he does that, he simply owes money to the, to the bookseller, but the third party who induced him to do it, I don't see how it's really libertarian to uphold the, the current legal theory of tortious interference with the contract, um, which is all you could really rely upon, I think, to get the third party uh, implicated, which is also an argument for the injunction against the third party in the trade secret case. But again, I think even that argument doesn't quite doesn't quite work. Yeah, I I, um, I, I I'd want to broadly agree with with Stefan's answer in terms of the um, sort of the legal mechanisms for for addressing the the question of justice that's involved here. Now, there may be a question of ethics, right? It's it's perfectly possible to be a jerk about copying things. And I think you shouldn't be a jerk. Um, but I think that that kind of question is a question that's not answered simply by appeal to whether you had this pre-existing agreement between the, the, like the bookseller and the person who bought it. It's also gonna depend on things like what the relationship between the downstream buyer is and, and the copyist. And it's also gonna depend on things like just what the, um, uh, you know, sort of what what the what the the um, what sort of the contract maker upstream has like a, a reasonable claim to expect, um, and you know I think it's it's certainly true that we ought to adopt an ethic that people who are doing good work you know uh, uh, should generally be encouraged to be able to make a living at it, and that you know uh, you should respect respect the work of artists that you value and things like that. Um, but I see no you know, so, so I see no legal reason in either case, no reason of justice, and I see no ethical reason at all in, in the case of, of you know, 
works that have, have uh, been around for a very long time that the author no longer particularly uh, depends upon. There are a number of other considerations that can come into effect of, uh, you know, sort of why it is that they should, should reasonably have a claim on expecting to make like a lifetime perpetual income uh, uh, from that kind of work. So in terms of the ethical question, I think there's, there are ways to be more jerky and ways to be less jerky. Um, and part of that, a lot of that is going to depend on like the concrete situation in the transaction. You know, the, the ultimate solution to a lot of this idea of how artists get paid, maybe everyone should be their own benefactor. In a, in a freed market, you work five hours a week, you make $100,000 a year, and the rest of the week you paint paintings. So you're, you're your own benefactor. I mean, we'd be so much wealthier, or you retire at 21, you know, and you become an artist for the rest of your life. Um, there's no reason to think that that couldn't happen. Can I tell you my definition of copyright? Oh, property? I would say property right is is a relationship between a, a human actor and a scarce resource. Define property. Define property. Well, I don't use the word property as a synonym for the object that is owned. I think that's a kind of mistake that a lot of people would say my property. Um, property just means a, a feature of a of, of an entity, uh, and it's used to mean you have a propriety or a proprietary interest in something which gets at exclusive legal control. So I would just say property means uh, the ownership of a human actor, by a human actor, of a scarce resource for some, for some reason, no, which I mean, we would say. It's, it's a social uh, definition. If, there were, if I was the only person on the planet, I wouldn't even talk about that. <clears throat> and the problem goes back to the Robinson Crusoe story. As soon as Russo discovered the presence of Friday, all of a sudden the property became an issue. And so you get to the question of, of how people are going to assert claims to be exclusive decision makers over certain parts of the universe that they find themselves in. And uh, my own my own view, having talked to this subject for 27,000 years, I think. But then the, whatever property rights we have derive from the willingness of our neighbor to come to the support of our claim. It has nothing to do with the government, it has nothing to do with you know, sound reasoning or anything like that. Uh, I assert a claim to be the exclusive owner of something, this, this bottle for example, uh, and then I call upon you to respect my claim. In other words, if you will not also a sort of claim of ownership. And as Stefan tries to take my uh, claim of ownership over this, this item, that you would be willing to come to my defense. And I think that's where, where it comes from. And you discover that this is not a, property is not a human invention. Uh, property interests are found throughout all life forms. Plants, insects, fish, animals, uh, all identify and defend property claims. There are a number of books that are written on this. Robert Archer's work, uh, Conrad Lorenz, uh, others who have taken the position uh, based on good empirical research, they find that all the other life forms uh, engage in this activity. Because everything, is what I call the Schaefer principle, everything has to be someplace. I don't know what, what else to call it. But, but to begin with, everything has to be someplace. And for you to survive, you're going to have to uh, exercise exclusive decision making over something. To the exclusion of everybody on the planet. You've got a hamburger, and you know, either you're going to eat that or you're going to starve. And so you're going to eat that uh, despite the fact that there might be some poor starving soul in front of you who would just love to have the hamburger. We need to wrap it up. And you get into the thoughts of competing claims. And you can play around with that all you want. You know, it's um, all kinds of fun, fun examples. But, but essentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a form of social metaphysics. I, that, that's the way I teach it in law school. It's, that's, that's what we're talking about, is social relationships. How do, we, how do we decide who gets to make decisions about what? 
and begin to yourself. You own yourself, and if you do, well, then certain other things show up. Yeah. So I, I think we're running up against the, the time limit for this session. Um, but uh, yeah, if anybody has any follow-up questions, then I'll be down at the uh, the ALL table over there, and then yeah, I'll be available too. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you very much.